Mrs. Strauss came to San Francisco to sell clothing to the growing population. But folks didn't just walk around the city wearing cool clothes and looking good. They had to eat, trade money, and see a show. Levi's is just one of the companies that was founded in San Francisco in response to the 49 gold rush. But there are a few others, some still sticking around today. Many of them have become cultural icons in their own right, too. Let's find out who they are as we explore the most unique pair of Levi's historical jeans out there. This is the 1878 Pantaloons episode, now on Den and Denim. I'm going to start this one out with my personal favorite, bread. Isadora Bodine immigrated from Burgundy, France, where his family had been master bakers for countless generations. He got swept up with the gold fever and wanted to try his luck panning with the 49ers. He soon began to notice he was making more money selling his extra bread than he was finding gold in the mines and riverbeds. So in 1852, he opened his first bakery. Isidore was making the classic French sourdough he learned to make as a kid. The difference was the foggy climate in Northern California that swept yeast and bacteria in the air. The creation of a new kind of sourdough bread. I'm talking the most sourest sourdough. Tons of tang here. Not just any bread, but unique because it had its own species of bacteria called Lactobacillus San Francisus. In 1941, a new master baker, Steve Gerardo, bought the bakery from the Boudin family and made it into an empire. He would sell the bread wholesale across America and it would become a staple in markets. The genius of making a bread bowl filled with clam chowder and Boudin's fun-loving animal breads are classic elements of San Francisco and California culture. Thank you. Of course, boudin has waned over time, and it's a very generic bread now. But there's so many artisanal San Francisco bakeries that you will find this just tangy sourdough you're not going to get in European sourdoughs. Man cannot live by bread alone. That's why there's chocolate. So saith my taste buds. No chocolatier from California is more famous than Ghirardelli. The story starts in 1849 with another hopeful European-born prospector who found no luck mining. Domingo Ghirardelli came from Apollo, Italy, near Genoa, the city that gave jeans their name. There, Ghirardelli had apprenticed to a local candy maker and brought that knowledge to California. He soon gave up mining and started selling mining supplies and confections to the miners. Soon he opened his own cafe. Despite having two factories burned down in one week in 1851, the company would return even stronger. Ghirardelli has had two big contributions to San Francisco. The first happened in 1865, when an employee discovered a way to drain the cocoa butter from drying chocolate to create a more intense chocolate taste in what we now call the Broma process. The second is the great light bulb sign which went up in 1923 celebrating its centennial this year. In 1999, the German-based chocolatier Lindt acquired all assets of Ghirardelli. You can find boxes of them at airports, and it's mediocre. Good for American mass-produced chocolate, but not the original. Etienne Guitard was another San Francisco chocolatier. He aimed to be a successful miner, but people kept convincing him to be a chocolate maker since he seemed to have a knack for it. He ventured back to France so that he could hone his craft and came back in the 1860s to become a rival of Ghirardelli. What I can say for Guitar that I can't say for Ghirardelli is the Guitar is still run by the original family, even with the Guitar name. I can't even say that for Levi's. You can buy Guitar chocolate. They're great for a home baker. And they do a lot of wholesales to restaurants in the western states. If you've had C's candy, then you've had guitar chocolate. Fantastic stuff. And if you want my opinion on the best C's, ooh, you gotta try the Bordeaux. I could eat a pound of that. No question. A butcher walks from New York to California. 
His name was Philip Armour, and he decided to cut and sell meat to gold miners and opens a store in Placerville, California, close to Sacramento. After the mining bust, he would move his company to Milwaukee and become one of the biggest meat packing companies in the country. Mr. Armour's neighbor in Placerville was a wheelbarrow maker named John Studebaker. Finding no luck in business, he also headed home to Indiana, where he switched to wagon making and made it rich selling covered wagons to organ-bound pioneers. His descendants would carry on in the transportation industry, making automobiles until the 1960s. Chinese immigration to the U.S. was fueled by the hardships occurring in China that they call the Century of Humiliation and the U.S. need for labor in the railroads. The logistics for the immigration were managed by the six companies, a.k.a. the first Chinese mafia of San Francisco, or rather a few distinct clans that had an on-and-off alliance. Most of their work was boring administrative bureaucratic red tape that they would conduct so there could be Chinese population in America. They would occasionally get nasty, blood would spill. Dude, this is the Old West, so violence was on the menu. Every story needs a bad guy, and no one was crueler in the Old West than the banks. A lot of our outlaw legends started out as honest citizens, until the bank took everything they had. Please recall that this is the Wild West, and bankers aren't sure how the new state of California will swing politically or economically. And not many big eastern bankers wanted to take risks out west. Of course, Henry Wells and William Fargo stepped up to take the reins and offered banking security for miners and entrepreneurs to save their riches. In 1860, Congress defaulted on their post office loan and Wells Fargo took over the western division of the Pony Express and retained mailing routes until 1905. After swallowing up several banks in Nevada and California, they emerge as one of the big four banks. San Francisco is a city with a rich literary history, from Alice Toklas to the Beats to Tonko Ice and Martin. But before all of them, there was a young, lanky Samuel Clemens roaming the Frisco streets looking for an interesting story. There are about four places in America that can claim Mark Twain as an official resident, but it was San Francisco where he got his start in fiction. It was in the mid to late 1860s, and Clemens was working as a journalist for San Francisco-based newspaper, The Daily Alta, under the name Mark Twain. He had actually tried out some silver mining in Nevada. It would be in now California that he pens and publishes his frog. first famous story, The Celebrated Frog of Calaveras County. There's a story about him in San Francisco, that shows his contrarian view to normality. A friend confided that he was depressed and wanted to commit suicide. Instead of talking him out of it, Clemens said he'd help him do it. Clemens drags his friend around town with buffoonery attempts at offing themselves. A gun that misfires, a noose that's too frustrating to tie, and drowning that just leaves them both cold and wet. By the end of the night, they're exhausted and ready for bed. Could it be possible that Sam Clemens met Mr. Strauss? Of course. There's no proof that they were good friends, but it seems very probable that they would have crossed paths at a tavern or somewhere. Both men were absolute schmoozers. They were gifted gabbers who could speak with almost any audience and get along with people of many classes and cultures. Samuel Clemens would go on to become America's great literary writer and really the first modern comedian. He was one of the jewels of humanity, with a personality that never ran out of character. He would give lectures on masturbation to polite society groups. He postponed the publishing of his autobiography and a few other stories because he knew the world wasn't ready for it yet. I've stated in the 1875 video talking about the arcuate that Jacob Davis was a master tailor, and he had a pension for innate stitching. The double X waist overalls were made for miners, but Jacob Davis wanted to make something in denim for the boss man. Thus, the pantaloons were born. Whereas 501s and double X are more square in the cut, 
There's a lot of curves going on in the pantaloons. This is a lot harder to do for a tailor, so it shows off the skill of the tailor. The pocket curves downward at the side, but the rear pockets are straight. The rear waistline has an M-shaped curve. There's shank buttons, but most likely the originals would have had sewn on buttons at the time. I think sewn on buttons would have worked wonderfully with this pair, adding to its elegance. LVC has released the pantaloons a few times. The last time I believe was 2013. They're very hard to find, but if you're just looking for something in this style of it, well, Bass Recast has a hemp-based version. Talking about what to wear them with, they're basically the component to a suit. These are the one of the best pairs of jeans you're gonna have that looks professional with a suit. That's why I think keeping them as rigid as possible so you don't have distress lines would look spectacular. Jacob Davis took out a patent for the improvement of pantaloons in 1878. His goal was to make a pair of jeans that had extra pieces of fabric at the areas of typical wear, those being the knees and the seat. He describes the knee fabric as being identical to the garment, so they would have been made of denim patches. If you got a rip on the outside of the knee, then you already had a patch matching it there. Another interesting note from this patent is that Davis intended to have two variations, a better quality and a cheaper grade. In the better version, the stitching would be hidden from the outside of the garment. For film recommendations, I've got a TV show this time, Warrior. It's in its second season, started about 2020. If you want to know more about the six companies, Warrior series was based on writings by Bruce Lee. And this TV show is set in 1860 San Francisco and follows the tale of a young immigrant who is looking for his family in San Francisco and battles the Chinese mafia that aligns with them. It's a complicated story. It's pretty. It has a similar aesthetic to Copper, but a lot more action and so much more over the top. If you got HBO and the missus is out, practice your kung fu moves to this one. For Mark Twain, there's a lot of Mark Twain based movies and a few biopics. Not much I'm really gonna recommend. But with the biopics, I always wonder how would the main person have seen their story? And I don't see how Sam Clemens could have been upset with The Adventures of Mark Twain, 1985. Claymation, mixing fictional characters into his own life. Definitely grab an edible for this one. It's free on YouTube. But the one I really fell in love with is Val Kilmer's live performance. It was amazing. If you were there to witness it, it was a treat. You can watch a recorded version in the movie Citizen Twain. Caution, this ain't for the pansies. If you are sensitive to language, then I implore your discretion. However, if you are fixing to relish in the finer delicacies of a literary icon, then this is a masterpiece. Yes, politics, that's just a show business for ugly folk. <laughs> Overall, these are the boss man jeans. They really look like a Victorian era pair of trousers made from denim. The shiny rivets add the steampunk touch and you could wear these with pride. I passed them up and I regret it. They're one of the unique styles of jeans Levi's was making when they were testing the waters for who might be a new denim customer. I'm not really sure who would have worn these historically. Perhaps miners who wanted to wear denim on a Sunday. We have no actual historic pairs of them, but we do have the patent information and recreating these was a nice addition to the timeline. That's one of the nice things LBC did do once in a while. I usually opt for historical accuracy, but recreating items that you think there might have been is a nice option too. They are denim, so they will distress and wear. The inlining fabric will decide some of the fading patterns. You will get these thick vertical lines from the lining seams. I'm not as much of a fan of that distression as I am for more organic styles. 
So keeping these dark and rigid as possible is the way I'd probably go with them. Have you got a pair of 1878 pantaloons? How do you wear them? Thanks for watching. Super thanks to my Patreon members. Join for a buck and get extra features. Help out the channel. I'm Dan. Love your jeans.